Jeff Gordon, <clears throat> and on behalf of the Milstein Center at Columbia and the ECGI, I'd like to welcome you to this event on Rethinking Stewardship. This is a notable event in many ways, <clears throat> but certainly one of them is how we have attempted to convert some of the limitations of the present time, our inability to share a common physical space into a strength because we have been able to bring together a strong group of speakers in such a large group of participants that we <clears throat> might not have been able to assemble in what might be called the before times. Our speakers literally span the globe. Israel, Singapore, England, France, Brazil, New York, California, Washington State, and the sovereign state of Delaware. Um, often I've been at events with law professor presenters where occasionally we've had one or two participants, senior participants from uh, the, in, the industry, but they are hard to get. Today we are fortunate to have senior folks from major asset managers and investors, pro approximately 18 trillion dollars in assets under management and senior advisors to this group. Apart from the potency of the Milstein Center uh, and ECGI brand, who can resist the invitation to spend all or part of your day in a Zoom meeting? I suppose it does beat taking a plane flight. <clears throat> I wanna call attention in certain ways to our co-sponsors and the Milstein Center. What's remarkable about the ECGI is that in less than 20 years, it has become a central player to bring together discussions and debates in the field. Yes, it's European, but as this event shows, it has become a central player and, and a facilitator of many important discussions that occur in the global space. The Milstein Center has its own pride of place, but it also shows how one visionary leader, Ira M. Milstein, can enlist, excite, and harness to good ends the efforts of others over a sustained period. I've worked with Ira at the Columbia Center for some time, and one steadily amazing and inspiring feature has been Ira's keen, keen sense of, of wanting to know what comes next in the world, his openness to new ideas and con, con, constant concern about the future. To refer to a pop song of a few year, years ago, Ira is one of those who can't stop thinking about tomorrow. Footnote, fleet, fleet, Fleetwood Mac. So there are 775 signed up for this event, literally from all over the world. And it's great to be able to share the discussion we have today so broadly and then afterwards to make available the recordings and the write-ups to facilitate further debate on these issues. It has occurred to me that this, these events attract such a broad following because they are in fact global governance discussions. Stock ownership exceeds, uh, it, it goes beyond the national limits. Investors and asset managers of different types and different national origin are important share shareholders in firms throughout the world. The economic performance of these firms and uh, the local disruption that may follow from some of their decisions have become a first order political importance in many nations. Although these firms are not created by their share shareholders, such owners, especially if large and well or, or organized, can exert a considerable influence. So global governance consists to some extent in the rules, conventions, habits, and ways of thinking that influence how these large owners exercise their governance rights. The English Romantic poet wrote a famous essay in 1821, a defense of poetry that contains his famous claim that the poets are the unacknowledged led, 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 legislators of the world. <clears throat> 
wow, that was a different world. Um, for today, we'll give that mantle to participants at our discussion of rethinking stewardship. So the final order of business before turning things over to Merritt Fox, my Columbia friend, is to state the theory of the case. What does it mean exactly to rethink stewardship? Stewardship by which we mean to refer to the behavior of investors and asset managers in their capacity as share shareholders on behalf of a broad range of beneficiaries has history. Here I give a US version in stripped down form. The performance of the US economy in the 1970s was subpar, the era of stagflation. US firms had been outcompeted by the Jap, Jap, Japanese in automobiles. Many US firms had morphed into di, 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 diverse enterprises that made no economic sense. Some check and accountability for such managerial performance seemed required, but the shareholders were dispersed, collective action hard. So hostile takeovers appeared on the scene, cost, costly, and of course, creating disruption in their wake. About the same time in the 1980s, it became clear that a new investor class was emerging, a class that then consisted of pen pension funds, mute mutual funds, in that endowments and similar investors. Many hoped that the reconcentration of ownership through these vehicles would lead, lead to better oversight and accountability. The issue, however, was that the business model of the managers of many of these funds, the asset managers, did not fit with robust firm specific monitoring and oversight. These, the funds were wide, widely diversified, many firms in a portfolio, and the way that the asset managers were evaluated, relative performance to benchmarks and against peers did not fit with the oversight goals. It's fair to say that the governance hopes of the reformers in that early period were disappointed. Matters came to a head in, in the events of 2007-09, in which outsized risk-taking by financial firms seemed to be a critical element in global financial distress. And then afterwards, the UK put a phrase that in common use, stewardship, into a stewardship code. But apart from its existence in code, stewardship was the call for these new this new cl class of investors and asset managers to step up to their responsibilities as owners. You might think of it as a kind of soft law. What does stewardship mean exactly? It's been taken to mean as engagement in a firm specific way with the firms that are in the investors portfolio. Diversified funds by construction hold hundreds, perhaps thousands of firms in the portfolio. What counts as adequate engagement? To what end? Is it to assure that managers are attending to the economic in, in, in interests of the shareholders? Should funds of their beneficial owners be required to devote the resources to firm specific oversight that may have little benefit for the fund as a whole? So the originator of the stewardship code movement, the UK decided that stewardship required a rethinking Engagement was not enough, it, be become a check. it had become a check the box affair, but for two different reasons. First, the firms were not delivering widely shared inclusive growth. And second, engagement alone did not carry a mandate with regard to a host of objectives that are compressed into the label ESG. But what elements of ESG should these funds pursue? And to what extent? And what about uh, the, economic, the, the economic goals of the beneficiaries? And what about the concern that Larry Fink or anyone sitting atop a large asset manager could become a modern king, a steward of the 21st cent cent century? 
A final piece to think about stewardship and stewardship codes is in the global dimension. Particularly in the US and the UK, these investors and asset managers have reconcentrated ownership that had in the past become high, highly diffuse. These owners are majoritarian owners. On average, about 70% of the stock in the, the biggest US firms is held in this way. But elsewhere in the world, that is not the pattern. Families are controlling owners, business groups controlling owners. These investors and asset managers are decidedly minority share, shareholders, yet con, con, countries adopt stewardship codes. What is that all about? All right, so I think we have a great day ahead. I'll turn it over to Merritt Fox to start us off and to run the show. Uh, well, good morning. Um, it's the, um, uh, uh, the moderator for this panel, Index Fund Stewardship. Uh, we have as our uh, main uh, presenter, uh, Lucian Bebchuk from the Harvard Law School. Uh, uh, Lucian, uh, along with Scott Hurst, has uh, been doing considerable writing uh, in this area. Uh, including a, a, a important article uh, that appeared in the last year in the, in the Columbia uh, Law Review. Um, and so he will give our principal remarks and then uh, our uh, other panelists uh, are, are Dorothy Lund um, from the USC Law School, uh, Richard Lacale uh, from State Street and Bonnie uh, Sene uh, from uh, ISS uh, ESG. Uh, um, uh, we have a little bit uh, unique uh, feature with Dorothy. Um, she went into labor last night, but she'll still be with us today. She had the foresight to uh, tape her uh, remarks uh, in advance. We have no further news, but if we um, find something out during the day, we'll let you know. Uh, so with that, uh, Lucian, if you can confine yourself to 20 minutes and each of the commentators to between 10 and 14 minutes, we'll have a little time for uh, Lucian to reply and, and, and perhaps some Q&A. Uh, so Lucian, uh, uh, take, it, take it away. So first of all, uh, best wishes uh, to Dorothy on this uh, major stewardship uh, uh, effort for, uh, for the new baby. And let me uh, uh, then... Uh, present the, uh, some of the key points of an analysis that as uh, Merit uh, just mentioned, we developed in uh, earlier work. Uh, the first piece in 2017 put forward an analytical framework for what uh, we view as an agency cost uh, perspective on institutional investors. There are then the uh, two uh, recent uh, papers that were circulated in the conference announcement, and Scott and I are, uh, are completing uh, uh, a new paper, The Power of the Big Three and Why It Matters, in which uh, we try to uh, respond to and engage with a number of practitioners and academics that responded to our work. So what uh, we try to do is to develop this agency cost view of index fund stewardship, we bring it to the data by uh, uh, piecing together both hand collected uh, data and publicly available data in order to form a picture of the full range of stewardship activities of the big three in particular. And uh, we conclude and argue that the evidence is largely consistent with the agency cost view. What do we mean by an agency cost view of investment fund stewardship? Uh, it's a view that is premised on uh, uh, the uncontroversial assumption that stewardship decisions are made not by the fund's beneficial investors, but by the investment fund managers. Uh, everybody would agree to this. The question is how important is this? And our work uh, shows that uh, agency uh, differences, agency problems are a first order driver of steward stewardship decisions in index funds. 
and you cannot really understand uh, uh, index funds decisions without examining the incentives of the managers. So when you listen throughout this day to various speakers who would uh, uh, put forward a view of what they think is a desirable stewardship on the part of institutional investors, we would argue that you have to think of whether uh, uh, this would be consistent and would be impeded in some way by the incentives of the index fund managers. Okay, now uh, central to the agency cost analysis is to have a benchmark as a, 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 a normative benchmark that you use for comparison purposes. And for us, the benchmark is the decisions that would best serve the beneficial investors of index fund managers. And those beneficial investors would be served both by some firm specific improvements and therefore firm specific stewardship, and also by some system-wide improvements and system-wide uh, stewardship. Uh, uh, you'll hear more about the second uh, type in GF presentation since he's most concerned with the second uh, type of improvement and stewardship. But from our perspective, both types of stewardships are uh, 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 included in our baseline because some of them is beneficial for the beneficial investors of the funds. And both of them, I will suggest to you, could be afflicted by agency problems. The two key uh, uh, agency problems are first, the underinvestment problem. Uh, and that's uh, uh, simply that index fund managers, as well as the managers of active funds, so this is not special just to the index fund manager, uh, have incentives to underinvest in stewardship. And this is relative to what would be desirable for the beneficial investors. The second problem, and I want to stress it uh, because to us, it might be the bigger problem uh, relative to the first one. And some of the commentators in this field who engage in our work, uh, we found that unfortunately focused on the issue of underinvestment of resources and time and paid insufficient attention to the second problem, which uh, uh, we label excessive deference. And that's the problem that index funds as well as other investment managers have incentives to be excessively differential to corporate managers because not being excessively differential will uh, uh, um, impose on them private costs that they would rather uh, avoid. Let me uh, note that we recognize some constraints on the severity of agency problems. Those agency problems are somewhat moderated, but we explain in our work, they are hardly eliminated by one uh, uh, fiduciary norms. People want to do quote unquote the right thing. And secondly, reputational considerations. Let me mention the second since recent discourse focuses on that. So index fund managers have reputational incentives, marketing incentives, uh, uh, various incentives to be perceived broadly as a good steward by their investors and others. Uh, and recent work stresses the ESG activities and the ESG rhetoric of the big three. We stress in our work that even though those reputational considerations and incentives are there and they are significant, incentives to be perceived as a good steward are very different than incentives to actually be a good steward. And therefore the former cannot ensure that we will have a good stewardship. And this is the case here because of the limited information that many beneficial investors have about the impact of stewardship decisions. So given this beneficial, this limited information and also the incentive to be differential to corporate managers, there are reasons to worry that we uh, spell out in our work that big three stewardship 
even in the ESG area, would produce more quote unquote governance talk and less results than is desirable for the beneficial investors of the big three and other index funds. Let me turn uh, uh, to the evidence. There are two parts to it, what the big three do and what the big three fail to do. What the big three do, first of all, we look at the in investment in stewardship. We have to remember that as we document, each of the big three has hundreds of $1 billion plus positions in individual portfolio companies. And the size of that position, if you look at the numbers, could justify uh, uh, from the perspective of the value of the portfolio, the beneficial investors having multiple professionals dedicating a substantial part of their time to monitoring and interacting with such a portfolio company. So having, if you have a one billion dollar position, saving several hundred thousand dollars a year to monitor and interact is not going to be wasteful, it would be beneficial from the perspective of the beneficial investors. However, using hand collected data, we show that the spending on stewardship for each of those big positions is not really economically meaningful. On average, it amounts uh, to less than 0.2%, uh, 20 basis points of the total fees of each of the big three. And this means that they could easily increase their stewardship resources by multiple, you know, increase them five or tenfold without really requiring any material change in fees, which is something that everybody in this field would like uh, 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 to avoid. And if you translate the dollars into time, we find that on average, each of the big three is able to spend no more than four person days for each $1 billion position. So this means that each of the big three is able to devote only a limited and cursory review of the documents and situation for the vast majority of their portfolio companies in which they are a major shareholder. What else do the big three do? There is the private engagement that the big three uh, are often stress that is central and that this is a superior tool that enables them to avoid using other shareholder tools that sometimes they are uh, uh, criticized for not using. But we document that if you look at each of the last three years, each of the big three had any engagement, including even one communication, one single engagement uh, with they had it, uh, such an engagement only with a very small minority of the companies in which they were a big stakeholder. The incidence of private engagement was 11% for BlackRock, 7% for Vanguard, and 6% for State Street. And what this means is that for the vast majority of companies, there is no private engagement whatsoever, and therefore the possibility of private engagement cannot make up for the, lack of use, for the lack of use of other tools to which I will be coming presently. Next, in what, uh, in what, in, uh, as to what the big three do, there is uh, what we document to be pro-management voting. Uh, for example, if you look at the incidence of no votes on sale and pay resolutions, it's three times lower for the big three than for the largest actively managed uh, 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 family funds, uh, mutual, <coughs> mutual fund. I'm not talking about activists or pension fund investors, just a uh, mutual fund investors. And uh, there is similar evidence in other recent studies. And this finding is consistent with the conclusion of our incentive analysis that the big three have an especially strong incentive to be differential to corporate managers and therefore to uh, uh, avoid uh, a pattern of voting that would seem uh, uh, non-friendly. Next, um, there is limited attention to performance. We argue that the beneficial investors of index fund would benefit from index funds 
paying attention when there is financial underperformance, monitor it and examine uh, whether there are any easy changes that could be done to address it. This is firm specific stewardship and monitoring, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not desirable doing it uh, for the many companies in which you might have financial underperformance would be beneficial for the portfolio and would uh, uh, be part of what desirable stewardship should include. And we explain why it's not desirable for the index fund just to rely on hedge fund investors to monitor alone financial underperformance. But then we provide evidence that outside the context of activist hedge fund intervention, the big three pay little attention to financial performance, either when they make voting decisions or when they engage in private behind the curtain uh, engagement. Last uh, 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 piece on firm specific stewardship, uh, Everybody here would agree that in terms of fitness of a director to a board, it matters not just what some governance and process dimensions are, like whether they are independent or were chosen through some good governance process, but also on some individual and company specific, what kind of industry background they have, what kind of educational tools uh, they have and so forth. And these are things that the big three pay close attention to when there is an activist proxy fight. But we document that outside the small number of proxy fights, the big three pay little attention to such director characteristics in casting votes on director re-election. And indeed, by looking through the whole universe of uh, uh, section 13 filings, we show that the big three avoid any communication with portfolio companies about the desirability of adding or removing particular individuals from boards. You can understand it given their cost structure and some regulatory barriers, but this is something that from a desirable stewardship perspective, it's uh, 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 unfortunate. Another and important for our purposes element of what the big three failed to do has to do with moving from firm specific stewardship to system wide improvements. That's what Jeff will be talking about as systematic uh, stewardship. We argue that there are reasons to worry and there is evidence supporting it that the big three and other index funds fail also in this uh, respect. Uh, uh, to start, those who view index fund stewardship more favorably than we do, uh, several uh, uh, papers are noted on this slide, stress that the big three through their voting for some shorter proposals and through their uh, uh, voting guidelines contribute to some large scale improvements in governance arrangement in many companies, say moving to annual elections, or to majority voting. However, this view on the partly full part of the glass fails to recognize that the big three fail to fill the glass as much as the interest of the beneficial investors would warrant and as they could readily do given their large power in the system. For one thing, uh, the big three could easily obtain much broader implementation of the governance arrangements that they themselves favor in their own voting guidelines if they just didn't commit themselves to the differential approach of avoiding the submission of any shareholder proposal under any circumstances. We document looking at the whole universe of corporate governance proposals and it's not surprising, but we, we just document it. It's not surprising given the policies uh, that they have is that during the past 15 years, including among the large subset of proposals that the big three always vote in favor, none of those uh, proposals were submitted by the big three. And as a result of that, because individual investors have limited resources and holdings, as a result of this, 
there is a large proportion of the companies in which the big three are major holders and in which the company continues to have governance arrangements that the big three oppose. Another uh, uh, dimension in which there is inadequate suboptimal contribution to system-wide systematic uh, stewardship, um, because they hold positions in many companies, if you have some beneficial wide-scale legal regulatory reforms, even if they provide a limited uh, a positive effect per company, contributing to the adoption uh, thereof could be significantly beneficial for the beneficial investors of the big three. We hadn't collect evidence on the full universe of comments that were submitted to SEC rulemaking in the past 25 years and on all the amicus briefs that were submitted in connection with significant judicial cases in our area. And we find that consistent with the agency cause view, the big three, notwithstanding the fact that they have, that they hold more than 20% of the equities in the market, decided to stay on the sideline systematically uh, uh, in those cases, which we explain is consistent with their private incentives, but does not serve the, the benefits of their portfolios and their beneficial investors. Let me end on just a, a brief, uh, 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 maybe a positive note. Um, I mentioned earlier that index fund managers have significant incentives to be perceived as responsible stewards. Uh, and therefore, in our view, to the extent that there is greater recognition by beneficial investors and the public of the incentive problems that we identify and of the evidence that we put forward, that by itself, this improved recognition can lead to improved stewardship. And therefore, we hope uh, uh, that our work and discussions like the one we have today will contribute uh, uh, to bringing about uh, such uh, changes. So uh, many thanks for uh, including us in this, uh, uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Merit. I, I yield the rest of my time. Okay, if all 40 seconds. Uh, <laughs> well, that was perfectly timed. Thank you very much, uh, Lucian. And uh, in a slight deviation from uh, alphabetical order, I think uh, for uh, technical reasons, we will start with the tape of, um, of Dorothy Lund and then uh, move on to Richard LaCale and uh, Bonnie uh, Sene. Um, and if uh, each of them can confine their remarks to 10 to 14 minutes, that would be, that would be perfect. Uh, so, uh, Chris, if you can get the tape of uh, Dorothy going. Thanks so much to the Milstein Center and, and ECGI for uh, convening this panel and, and, and including me. Uh, and I'd like to start by saying uh, I very much agree with Lucian that the institutional investors that primarily invest in passive funds have incentives to underinvest in stewardship and be excessively deferential to management. I also think it's clear that the rise of passive investing has led to a massive aggregation of governance power in the hands of the so-called big three. And I think this concentration of power coupled with these incentive problems is likely to have negative consequences for corporate governance down the road. So in this way, I differ from Lucian. So I'm gonna say more about these negative consequences and then I'll tell you about how I think these problems could be addressed. So there are many reasons to be concerned about how the presence of largely passive uh, block holders will affect the stewardship landscape, but I want to emphasize two main takeaways that I think we can draw from the very compelling evidence that Lucian has gathered. So first, Lucian's evidence suggests that the rise of passive investing is likely to result in a stewardship vacuum that's going to have negative consequences for company performance. So we know the big three only engage with about 10% uh, uh, of their portfolio companies each year. Uh, that's despite the fact that 
the term is broadly defined to include any communication with management. And despite the fact that the big three are often uh, the company's largest shareholders, they're not engaging with the vast majority of the, the uh, portfolio companies. And there's empirical evidence that suggests that a lack of engagement, a lack of monitoring from large shareholders leads to problems. So study by researchers for Ed Booth shows that companies with their, uh, that had their largest shareholders distracted, uh, those companies were more likely to announce value destroying acquisitions and overpay their CEOs. In addition, it, passive fund interventions to the extent they occur at all might not be beneficial because of their lack of an incentive to devote substantial time and resources to stewardship and engagement. So the main governance tool employed by the big three is voting. And as Lucian's evidence highlights, their voting records are not always so great. And as they can grow to control a larger fraction of the votes, I think their voting may actually distort electoral outcomes in a way that's harmful and for companies and their shareholders and especially when it comes to the big ticket items that you know highly contested proxy contests and the merger votes so it's just an example consider how a stewardship group with little information or time would resolve a proxy contest imagine being bombarded with conflicting information 300 page slide decks phone calls etc about two very divergent uh, courses of action, and then being asked to choose without much information about the company or, or management quality. And it's true that the big three large stakes do provide an incentive to invest in information, whatever that voting decision could materially affect the stock price, which would of course increase the amount of fees collected. The problem though is that the institution is the one that benefits, not the individual staff on the governance team who don't have their compensation tied to the outcome of these votes in any way. Not only that, understanding that financial impact of a vote requires some information, information that the government governance team might not have. There's also a strong incentive to defer to management in these moments. So voting against management in a highly contested vote is very likely to jeopardize the institution's business relationship. And that's a surer bet than guessing whether a vote against management is going to lead to a substantial increase in the portfolio's value. So like Lucian, I disagree that we can rely on activist hedge funds to tee up problems for passive investors to weigh in on. As the empirical evidence shows, passive institutional investors are very likely to vote with management and, and in the rare cases they oppose management, we can't be particularly confident that they've come to the right decision. And just to take one example of, of uh, these incentives at play, we'll look at the DuPont proxy fight in 2015, where each of the big three sided with management, unlike most other large institutional investors who sided with the dissidents. And the big three's lack of support dealt a winning hand to management and caused the stock price to drop 7% when the outcome was announced. So to summarize, I think the rise of passive investing is, is particularly troubling for two reasons. I think first, the largest and most influential shareholders of companies are the least likely to monitor and intervene when problems arise. And second, when active shareholders attempt to intervene themselves, those interventions are less likely to succeed. So what's the solution if we think these incentives are, are uh, compromising things or will be? Uh, Lucian offers many interesting proposals that are aimed at improving index fund stewardship uh, and also minimizing their conflicts of interest. And in my research studying index fund engagement, I've taken a different approach and I've proposed minimizing the influence of index funds and governance altogether, such as by restricting uh, their voting power. So at first blush, a limitation on index fund voting seems to be an extreme solution, but I think if you take a closer look, you'll see it's actually a less radical approach than encouraging index funds to be better stewards. So first, let me say a little bit why about why I think encouraging investments in stewardship is, is likely to be detrimental. So as, as Lucian points out, the incentive to underinvest in stewardship comes from those very low fees that index funds charge their investors. So the solution contemplates raising the fees that investors would pay. 
And that fee increase would be substantial given the size of these index fund portfolios and the amount of resources that adequate stewardship would require. So I think this is a double-edged sword for investors who clearly benefit from low index fund fees and who might not be inclined to invest in the index fund if the costs were the same as those levied by active funds. It's true, of course, that investors are harmed from free riding, passive fund free riding to the extent that it's going to worsen company performance over time. But the key point here is that not every investor needs to be engaged in governance to avoid problems. In fact, in many ways, it's optimal that not every investor, you know, uh, engage in duplicative research costs associated with voting and stewardship. The problem is when you have the largest and most influential shareholders who are not pulling their weight. And, and as I've described, this could lead to a dynamic where active investors are crowded out or not able to intervene successfully. So rather than try to force index funds to fight their incentives, which again would increase costs for investors and, and might not work as intended, why not permit index funds to free ride but lim limit their influence when they do? So I'll say more about this in a moment, but first I wanna highlight also that the Lucian solution would would exacerbate a different problem, which has been dubbed the, the problem of 12 by John Coates, which is that as a result of the rise of indexing, we have concentrated governance power in the hands of a small number of unelected and unaccountable people. So if we regulate in the way that Lucian proposes, we'd leave the big three with even more power over time. So why not consider distributing power differently? And one option that I initially proposed would be to restrict passive fund voting, which would then leave governance decisions to investors that are better informed. And I envisioned a presumption that any fund that uses an indexing strategy would be restricted from voting or required to mirror vote. And that presumption could then be rebutted if the fund showed its governance group relied on meaningful portfolio company research or had access to information generated by active funds. So that rule could, in fact, encourage some passive funds to, you know, invest in adequate research, while others could simply choose to free ride. An alternative approach would be for companies to proactively issue a share class of non-voting shares for passive funds to buy. And this, again, would allow passive funds to free ride and, and would let better informed shareholders dictate voting outcomes. And either approach is going to avo avoid the distortions created by passive investing. But there's also some obvious problems. One is that if we had enough passive funds not voting, we could get a power vacuum where small idiosyncratic investors or insiders could easily buy up control. But that's unlikely to happen unless you take out a very, very large percentage of the vote. Even if half of a company's investors held non-voting shares, every remaining shareholder's voting power would double. So a 2% shareholder would become four percent shareholder and so on and that's not enough to meaningfully change voting outcomes of most companies but i think this concern gets at a deeper issue raised by lucian and, and others who say well passive funds aren't great but they're not worse than other investors including actively managed mutual funds and well i don't think pa active funds are, are perfect stewards i think Lucian's analysis neglects three ways in which active funds have substantially better incentives to engage in stewardship than index funds. So first, stewardship is much more costly for passive funds than it is for active funds. So Marco Bex shows us in a new paper uh, that studies the uh, engagement activities of an active manager that active funds are actually able to leverage firm-specific information generated by uh, people trading, uh, investment analysts, and, they, and they're using this for their stewardship and voting. Of course, they also have smaller portfolios, which means that the information acquisition is less expensive. Um, can reap outside gains from, from in, you know, investments and stewardship. Uh, in their competition with, uh, that's going to help them in their competition with active and passive funds. And, and finally, the conflicts of interest that Lucian identifies are more pronounced for index funds, which have fewer ways to differentiate themselves and attract clients. So for that reason, these relationships with portfolio companies are, are really important. Okay, so to summarize, although I, I know the idea of restricting index fund voting appears quite radical at first blush, uh, 
I think it's actually the more conservative path forward. It would allow index funds to continue to operate under a business model that offers investors many benefits. It would maintain the existing status quo and governance where activist shareholders tee up proposals for relatively sophisticated but rationally reticent shareholders to vote on. It would minimize the problem of 12. And, and it finally, it's also consistent with the economic theory that analyzes shareholder voting. You know, the one share, one vote default has been justified as efficient because it's giving voting power to the shareholders that are best positioned to use it, which has been those shareholders with the largest stakes in the company. But when the largest block holders have the worst incentives to engage in monitoring, it, it may be time to revisit this rationale for an equal distribution of voting power. Okay. Um, I think that worked um, and we'll have to uh, uh, send uh, Dorothy our thanks uh, when she's uh, ready to receive them. Uh, so uh, without further ado, if we can go on to uh, Richard LaCale uh, from uh, State Street. Richard? I you need one. Yeah. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, that was terrific. And um, I absolutely uh, loved the presentation by uh, Mr. Pepchuk. I think, as you would expect, I wouldn't agree with all the conclusions, but I think he uh, certainly um, pointed out some interesting facts um, and I think I'd like to respond to some of those uh, from a State Street Global Advisors perspective as one of the big three as he would uh, portray us. Uh, so firstly, State Street itself is a large financial services organization. Uh, we're a GSIB regulated in many places that embeds a certain caution uh, within the philosophy of the organization as well. Uh, notwithstanding that, we've had uh, an asset management business for um, over 40 years, and it's been a little bit different to others, as many have pointed out. We've been a pioneer in indexing, um, and we're now one of the largest providers of index fund management services, as well as many others uh, around the world. And with that has brought a little bit of a different perspective, perhaps from active managers on this important question of stewardship and engagement. And maybe that's at the heart of some of the um, differences that might arise between um, you know, perceptions or observations that uh, Mr. Beb Chuck would make and those from us who are actually undertaking uh, asset stewardship. Um, maybe firstly, our viewpoint on ESG as an organization, we think that these extra financial, so-called extra financial factors are important, both in the running of our organization uh, and as our role as, as an investment manager. We've embedded them in our investment processes. Um, obviously, they're embedded implicitly or explicitly in our asset stewardship and proxy voting. Uh, and in recognition of that, we were recognized by UNPRI as one of the 20 leaders um, from a PRI perspective. We're very proud to have achieved that. Um, I think it, that, and that was more about actual than perceptions, if I can uh, steal the phrase from, again, from Lucien. Um, I think we are accountable first and foremost to our clients for delivering uh, on the long-term objectives that they have when they're entrusting their capital with us. And the voting power and engagement is an important part of that ingredient of long-term performance. I think stewardship as an, an index manager, as many have pointed out, is a little different. I think the discussion about resourcing is always a valuable one. Are we under or over invested in the amount of resources that we're putting into stewardship? But what we may all agree on is that stewardship as an index manager is, is a little bit different to stewardship if you hold a very, very small number of securities. And I think one thing that index managers are clear about is that their role, uh, what their role is, what the role of the board is in relation to management. And I think sometimes in the discussion about stewardship, there's been a little bit of blurring of the edges. And some of the things that are suggested as legitimate aims for stewardship are really um, better described as roles of the board. So we think first and foremost, it's important that we have strong independent boards overseeing management because first and foremost, it's their role to hold management accountable. Now there are cases where obviously we need to hold boards accountable, 
they are in turn accountable for actions within the company. But I think index managers owning so many securities may place more emphasis on the sort of these uh, sort of macro views of the investment process rather than a, an active manager who has a very limited number of holdings who may have important and valuable observations about the strategy of the business or where, where they want the business to go uh, by virtue of having a much higher dependency on a smaller number of securities. So with an index manager, in a sense, you own everything. You're interested in the performance of the market as a whole, how we can get competitive economies and therefore deliver greater shareholder returns. And the key to that often is in those very strong and independent boards, rather than focusing necessarily on individual firm specific issues. And I think that's why maybe the resourcing is also a little different uh, in terms of stewardship and governance for index managers than it would be for uh, a manager who has a very strong dependency on individual firm results uh, in a very concentrated portfolio. It's also worth pointing out we're still minority. I mean, we point out the you know, or it has been pointed out the power of the big three. We are minority investors already collectively. Our clients are minority investors um, and decisions are not taken. In, you know, we, we don't dominate in any stretch of the imagination uh, decision making from a proxy voting perspective. We also vote differently from one another. And those who've studied this, I think, have observed that the big three take different viewpoints on important issues. And I think it's, it's vital that we retain you know, that degree of independence. I think muddying together the big three and in a sense, by implication, hoping for some sort of collective action, um, I think is, is very misguided. Um, and I think leads us down the wrong track. So we're, a mi we're minority investors. We're different from one another. We focus on long-term issues. Uh, and an example of that would be um, perhaps some of the elements of ESG that we've focused on that maybe active management would say, well, in any given year, or any given multi-year period, that's not the most important item on the agenda for that particular company. But when you own a portfolio of a thousand or five thousand companies, those systematic issues, maybe to do with the effectiveness of the board through diversity, for example, become much more significant. So it's a reason why it's understandable that active managers will focus on different things, perhaps rightly, from those who are managing. Um, across a much wider portfolio. And they're therefore interested in more system-wide issues. It's the reason, for example, why you know, Germany would be concerned about the tenure of directors and how we can have better board refreshment in Germany, because we think that's one way in which corporate uh, governance and by implication, by strong implication, long-term performance of German corporates would improve. Now for any individual company, there will be issues to do with tenure of directors but it's really the, 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 the systematic um, improvement in governance that we're most interested in. I think the other difference, and um, we mentioned activists as well, activists often have very strong insights into, into individual companies, but they equally have a set of incentives that may not be congruent to say the least with very long-term investors who, who have very large and well-diversified portfolios. And so when you have um, activists approaching companies with a you know, a solution or an improvement. Often there was an era where it was levering up the company, um, you know, much more active uh, sense of selling off a component. That may be the right answer for some companies, um, but it may be that we're guilty of being swept up into, into short-termism. And so as index managers, we have to be extremely careful to make judgments. Um, and DuPont was raised as one a little bit earlier. We make judgments, we listen to both sides in that sort of argument we involve our fundamental analysts because I think in common with the rest of the big three, we also have fundamental active businesses that can also provide insights um, into those competing priorities when you've got a, um, a fork in the road, so to speak, from a, a corporate history perspective. Uh, and so we in include them in the conversations as well. But it's not to say that hedge fund activists are have got um, incentives that are not about value maximization but the time horizon might be a little different. And again, we need to be a little bit careful about um, concluding that those who are very active have got it right all the time. We need to be a little bit humble about uh, the role of activists in particular and try to make good judgments about what works uh, in the very, very long term. And that brings on to this measurement problem. I think a, a couple have mentioned already that 
how do you measure whether stewardship has been successful? Uh, we publish the results of our activity, uh, but I have to admit it's very hard to measure. I mean, the, in a sense, the sort of type two error when you, you didn't in, intervene and couldn't uh, is one that we certainly need to be focused on. Uh, but we also need to look at where intervention happened or there was a desire by activists to have change happened and frankly wasn't successful. If you look at back at corporate history, certainly in the 90s, there was an era where um, activism actually was not helpful for companies. And in a sense, boards did need, in a sense, the ballast of those longer term investors to be able to resist uh, some of the urges of short term activists. There was perhaps a comment that, uh, uh, or at least a chapter of the discussion um, that I take more exception to, and that's the deferential to corporate managers. Um, we're quite comfortable with voting against management, um, but we don't regard it as a badge of honor to vote against management either. Um, and I think that the, there's a perception that if we vote against management, it somehow makes life difficult for us. Um, We've done it, I've done it. I've been in conversations with boards and we've voted against the board in, in a disagreement with them on some issue. And it hasn't damaged the relationship. Clearly they know that we're a long-term investor. We're interested in the long-term health of the company. Uh, and the idea that that would somehow be a, an incentive for uh, an excessive deference, just, it doesn't stack up. Um, and I think from personal experience that I, I can understand why you might put that forward as an issue, um, but I guess my personal experience having engaged in this is that it really doesn't um, cut the mustard, so to speak, as an argument. So I think in conclusion, we, we have been active, we stand by our record, we publish our voting, we're different from the rest of the big three, we're proud of the differences and the resources we put in, but I think it's a really, really important debate, the question how much do we put in, is it too little? Uh, is it too much? Do we become the apocryphal hammer that's looking for a nail um, everywhere he looks or, or he or she looks? Um, so in conclusion, I think the index funds are different to other investors. They have a unique perspective as they have a very, very long term perspective. It means they focus on somewhat different things and need somewhat different resources to do so. And we're very happy to be held accountable by our clients uh, for the actions we take. Um, and the resources that we, uh, that we put. And we'd like to be measured by them on that basis. So I look forward to the rest of the debate. And by the way, the, the questions that I've seen coming in, I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to answer some of those as well. So fantastic Q and A, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard and uh, Bonnie, if we can uh, move on to you. Absolutely, thank you so much, Merrick. Great. I hope everybody can uh, can see my screen. Um, before I get started, just a, a few comments following on uh, Richard's um, uh, uh, presentation. First of all, it's an honor to be here with everybody today. Um, I would actually agree very much with Richard on several of the comments uh, made specifically as it relates um, uh, to votes against management. One of the things that I would like to do is share some independent ISS CSG findings uh, based on uh, voting execution by the uh, big three as identified during today's session. I'd also like to set up sort of the industry framework, what we're, what we're really facing today in terms of, of ownership and trends that we're beginning to see from a market perspective. Um, I'd also like to propose a um, possibly an independent solution um, that is neither costly, I think, as we've identified by today's discussions, um, or restrictive in terms of um, exercising voting rights. In addition to that, I'll share some information as it relates to voting trends and behaviors. And I think the key here is that um, you know focused engagement um, will be critical um, ultimately and uh, in ensuring that we have long-term stewardship execution. So with that, let me go to the next slide. All right, so um, effectively what we see here are some interesting data points. The US ESG ETF market currently represents approximately 37% of the combined daily volume of all US stock exchanges and is expected to reach 5.3 trillion um, in AUM by year end. More than 80% of all assets that have flowed into investment funds in the past decade have gone into index funds. 98% um, of all of the uh, ETFs today in the market are passively managed 
U.S. ETF assets have been growing roughly at 25% annually over the past decade. And the top five ETF sponsors, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, and Charles Schwab First Trust, preside over 80% of the total assets today in the ESG market. ESG, excuse me, the ETF, the broader ETF markets. Um, between 2014 and 2019, uh, five of the 10 largest fund families voted against more than 88% um, of ESG-related shareholder resolutions. But let me put that in context as we discuss some of the findings later in the deck. If we look at the concentration of assets in ESG ETFs, the top six US-focused ESG ETFs have approximately 16 billion of AUM. 23% of that total AUM from the six funds is allocated, um, excuse me, is allocated across the 11 holdings that all of the ETFs own. 41% of the total AUM from the six funds is allocated across 31 holdings, 50% of the total AUM across six funds is allocated across 60 holdings. And then we'll get into the importance of um, why this concentration across ESG ETFs specifically will be important as we think about it through a stewardship context. Let's talk about um, different examples of stewardship. So if we look at specifically um, stewardship today, there is what we call delegated stewardship, obviously not, uh, not a, a best practice. Delegated stewardship refers to outsourcing of proxy voting and engagement services to third party providers. We do see this in several cases as it relates to voting uh, and taking voting actions against conflict of interest, identified con conflict of interest um, uh, situations uh, within uh, asset management shops. Um, in some of these instances, a portion, a portion of stewardship uh, activities such as engagement would be managed externally through a third party agent. Um, let me just also share a context here. I spent 20 years in asset management before moving to ISS ESG, so um, uh, actually building out the uh, responsible investment platform. So, so do bring um, some aspects of both really solutions providers as well as um, asset management um, approaches. Now, let me get into decentralized stewardship, which I think is an interesting concept that I'd like to explore a little further today. Decentralized stewardship, quite frankly, is, is, is probably one of the most complex and difficult, I think, to build and monitor internally within an asset management organization. But as Richard had mentioned, um, you know, there each of these uh, big three have fundamental active equity analysts, and there is a unique opportunity to really leverage that expertise in a more meaningful way. Um, and so a decentralized model effectively refers to direct alignment of voting engagement facilitated exclusively by, by the fund managers on the active equity side who are making buy-sell decisions. So in the case of index funds, this process could be applied through a proportional or majority voting application. So essentially what this means is that fundamental active equity managers um, within these organizations are making these decisions, they're engaging with these corporates, um, and then they are able then to echo or mirror that vote against the, um, the passive shares um, across, the, across the, um, the organization. So it's a very interesting concept. It's one that has worked successfully in, in a few firms, and I think one that ultimately may provide an interesting uh, input and solution, again, that is neither costly nor restrictive as it relates to voting execution within the big three. The other topic is centralized stewardship, referring to how an asset manager organizes both engagement and voting through a centralized stewardship team. So, you know, as, as we know, most, uh, uh, the, most of these conversations have really, um, really centered around some of the issues related to centralized stewardship. I, I would argue that these teams have um, continue to build um, and facilitate very strong engagement. And we are seeing results of that, um, specifically as we have seen this marked shift to responsible capitalism. And I'll talk more specifically about what that looks like in some of the voting outcomes. These firms are typically, um, will typically apply one vote, all shares approach, and, and, do, and typically will centralize all stewardship activities. In some situations, we do also have hybrid stewardship. So a hybrid stewardship function consists of elements of both delegated and centralized and or decentralized decision-making for the execution of voting and engagement. It could certainly involve committees comprised of stewardship, compliance, legal operations, and investment personnel. Um, these committees are generally uh, constructed uh, to not only, um, or excuse me, to only identify outliers based on a principles-based framework. So not necessarily looking at the entire universe, but certainly those that are identified as uh, problematic based on signals using both corporate disclosure as well as alternative data sets um, to identify controversies. 
uh, if we take a look at how companies are being assessed today, there was a very interesting report um, that was uh, released um, really assessing the stewardship capabilities of the big three. And um, what they looked at was proxy voting policies, practices and records, and engagement policy, practices and activities, climate policy adoption and execution, which as we know, alignment to the TCFD is now a requirement of the principles for responsible investment, as well as stewardship for uh, resources and operating systems and disclosure. So, um, you know, really across all three, and I won't go through specific detail as I think most of it is captured here, but we do see that um, there is a tremendous amount of, um, again, what I would call very engaged um, uh, dialogue with corporates, and um, and this is all actually published within their um, their annual uh, disclosure, their stewardship disclosure reports. So we are beginning to see, I think, distinct movement and um, what I would call again, um, you know, again, this shift to this responsible capitalism away from um, you know primary shareholder primacy uh, models that we've experienced in the past. Some interesting patterns. Um, so the vast majority of proxy proposals, and I think it's important to take a very focused approach as we think about this entire uh, topic. The vast majority of proxy proposals today are routine management proposals. Shareholder proposals only account for about 2% of all proxy proposals. So um, that's number one, a very important, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, point to, to really underscore here. If we highlight, for example, just BlackRock um, in this situation, we'll talk more specifically about State Street and, and uh, Vanguard as well. But BlackRock's votes against um, 728 overboard corporate directors just um, in 2020 this year really indicates a jump of about 69% between 2018 and 2020. So we are seeing considerably more um, active um, approaches as it considers as we consider sort of the um, the opportunity to exercise voting rights and 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 take and draw a line in the sand um, as it relates to uh, uh, directors. Um, about half of all shareholder proposals are sponsored by a small handful of individuals or organizations. Um, and in 2017, approximately 65% of ISS recommendations were for shareholder proposals compared to approximately 35% of funds voting for votes cast. Um, I will tell you, having come from the asset management side, though, you really have to look at shareholder proposals, not from a blanket perspective, but in terms of, quite frankly, the materiality and, and links to, quite frankly, the opportunity of these companies, um, again, to, to, to deliver um, you know, and, and, and build long-term value creation. And so not every shareholder proposal has merit. And I think that's an important, um, uh, important topic that, that really needs to be underscored here. Um, in addition, ESG ETFs had consistently voted against at a rate of above um, the overall firm vote rate, um, but in 2019 for the first time actually dropped. Um, fund houses are getting better at identifying uh, poor compensation practices as well. Um, really quickly, just want to discuss a few things around voting trends. According to an independent ISS ESG study over the last five years, investors have demonstrated fewer against votes on management say on pay, um, but actually more against votes on director issues, particularly with companies of no women on the board. So um, director elections as it relates to diversity, and we continue to see a very strong collective in terms of really helping to push um, greater diversity across um, across directors. Um, uh, holding these seats across corporate boards. Um, also, according to the study, State Street Global Advisors most actively votes, so Richard, um, back to your, your commentary earlier, uh, most actively votes against management on director related and uh, management say on pay proposals. Vanguard um, is uh, singularly the most active on management say on pay proposals as indicated by the study as well. And just wanted to leave everybody with this as well. Um, it's interesting, there's a, 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 a great piece presented by uh, Elroy Dimson and, and Ozan Caracas that really talk about the power of coordinated engagements and so from Cambridge University. Um, you know, really they discuss what they call their two-tier engagement strategy so that when you have a lead investor, um, you know, uh, who is leading the charge on a, um, an engagement and supported by smaller investors, um, you know, from, from international markets, so the lead investor has to be located domestically. Um, you, they were seeing, you know, success rates uh, distinctly elevated, financial and accounting performance improved, and lead investors um, you know, again, really helped me to drive sort of, sort of what we call this investor coalition. So with that, um, that is uh, 
my discussion points that I, I wanted to share today. And thanks again for the time. Well, thank you, uh, Bonnie, um, and thank everyone for uh, staying on schedule. Uh, it leaves us about um, five, uh, I'm sorry, about uh, 10 minutes um, uh, till um, the, we'll take a, a break at 10.55 uh, at Eastern time. Um, so Lucian, let me just give you um, a couple of minutes to, um, uh, if you'd like to, to respond and then uh, we have a little bit of time, uh, we can uh, take some Q&A. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Merit, and uh, thanks a lot for all those uh, very uh, interesting and valuable reactions, and we'll try uh, uh, to engage with them uh, uh, in the uh, a new paper that we are writing that tries to, uh, to engage with uh, a new different views. Let me offer quickly just a reaction to each of the commentators. There's obviously a lot in those comments. Uh, to Dorothy, uh, we share concerns. The reason why Scott and I don't go in the direction of uh, are willing to consider taking the vote from index funds is because our analysis uh, indicates that active funds and retail investors are not necessarily better. Indeed, there are various factors that go in the opposite direction and that might make uh, uh, some of index fund voting uh, are more informed. Um, it's a complicated area. We have this analysis in the paper, but because we don't really reach the conclusion that the index funds are generally worse and indeed that they are often better than some other shareholders, our approach is to paraphrase Mark Anthony's, we don't want to bury uh, uh, index fund voting. We want uh, just to, uh, to improve it. Um, to Richard, and uh, I think also to Bonnie, uh, uh, one reaction. So you mentioned a lot of things that the index funds are doing. This is obviously a complicated area and uh, this is a massive operation. And obviously there are lots of things that are happening. And the question is, how do you evaluate them in terms of do we have a sufficient shortcoming to raise our concerns? And I would uh, just to pick up one that I mentioned in the slide, but let me stress again, uh, there are various arrangements that clearly the big three would like to see happen. They are all in favor of majority voting. They are all in favor of eliminating supermajority provisions. We can all within a few minutes download the names of hundreds of companies that still have arrangements that the big three are strongly against. I submit that the big three having more than 20% of the shares in all those companies, if they wanted to, they could get those arrangements. They could submit a proposal and get it to happen. Indeed, if they were just willing to send a letter and say, if you don't follow this, we would view you as informally as having failed uh, and we would have the same consequences as if you didn't follow a shorter proposal, it was going to happen. So there, sure, kudos to various things that the big three were able to happen. But as an academic look at it from the outside, there are very big fractions of the glass that remain uh, uh, um, in a way that is concerning to me empty and that I think the big three could easily uh, uh, get uh, uh, filled. Uh, and the last uh, reaction, and that's to, uh, uh, to Richard. By the way, Mary, I also have reactions to the uh, various comments that came through the chat, if you will want me to, to respond to them later. Um, there is the question, and I understand this, the tendency to say our model, our business model doesn't enable us to follow financial underperformance, given that we have hundreds of companies. Now, partly is what academics call endogenous. It's a question of, and obviously the big three have the resources. If you want it, you could you know, get stuff. The question is the following to me. When a hedge fund activist comes and raises the issue of financial underperformance, you look at it 
and you make a judgment call whether this financial underperformance merits the governance changes that the activist calls for and so forth. And from the point of view of beneficial investors in the big three, and I am one of them with my own retirement account, I would prefer, and I think it would be in my interest, if you have some sort of a system that even if an activist hedge fund doesn't show up, if there is a systematic financial underperformance, it elevates it to someone who looks at it, has a conversation, looks to see whether there are some governance improvements that could be made and so forth. So I think that's something that, that could be done. And I know what are the impediments to this happening, but from my perspective, the question is whether those impediments are consistent with optimal stewardship. Let me stop here before Merit gets uh, upset. <laughs> uh, never. Um, uh, so uh, do uh, uh, either uh, Bonnie or Richard want to uh, respond to anything that, um, that Lucian has said? Richard, I'll let you. On, on the... Sorry, Bonnie, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to say Richard, by all means. Um, on that last point, we do have a filtering mechanism which does focus on financial underperformance um, of companies as a trigger for more, you know, I, I don't want to call it investigation, but analysis, engagement. So that absolutely does happen. Now, whether it happens in the same way or with the same intensity as an activist hedge fund is a, a fair question. Um, but that is one of the drivers internally, and that's how we prioritize our resourcing within the asset stewardship team. Yes, a quick reaction to this. Uh, one thing that you don't have, and I, uh, as a beneficial investor, I would like to see, is if you look at the voting guidelines that you and the other big three provide, which are very helpful, you see a very long set of reasons that would provide you to withhold support from a director that get you dissatisfied in one way or another. And financial underperformance, which to many long-term beneficial investors is very important, doesn't get, and it's not State Street, it's the big three in general. Uh, if you look at the voting instructions on withhold, there are so much governance focused and financial underperformance is not that significant there, if at all. But let me stop here. Yeah. Bye. Because the, the guidelines around directors are specifically on, on governance related issues. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a vote against a director based on financial underperformance. But first and foremost, that's the criteria that we've drawn. Right, up. right. So basically you have, right, you have the lever, which is a very important lever. We know the directors very much care about it if you might withhold support. And that particular lever is used for governance purposes and less for sending signal on financial performance. Now, this is not a secret, we all know that the big three are focused on you know, governance. And you were saying that you believe that good governance will provide a foundation then to financial performance. But the question is, is that indeed the optimal level of stewardship? But this is something we can continue discussing. Yeah, um, Bonnie, uh, just uh, if, if both you and Lucian could be quick because we're supposed to cut off in a minute or two. Yeah, no, I think I think all of you know. I think what I would say is that the engagements inherently um, are really geared toward long-term value creation. It's the ability to signal what may happen specifically. So it's not just taking a look at current and existing underperformance within a within a company, but it's also looking at the ability to signal and identify. So forward-looking scenario analysis that helps to identify that, whether that be through top line growth, it could be through cost reductions, um, you know, material costs, for example, to carbon and water, um, regulatory or legal implications, um, you know, uh, investment optimization. I mean, there's a number of different things that I think, uh, you know, would be and, and provide sort of critical, meaningful um, basis for engagement long-term. Okay. Um, I think we should 
leave it at that. I'm sorry that we didn't have time for Q&A, but we had a very vigorous discussion uh, with lots of ideas. And so um, the powers that be say we have a five minute uh, break and they're supposed to start again at, um, at 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern time. Thank you very much, Merit. Thank you, Merit. Thank, Thank you. you.